Hey guys, it's Matt. Thank you for downloading the latest episode of the Obsessive Viewer Podcast. I want to let you know ahead of time that this is a special episode of the podcast. Uh, it was recorded at Starbase Indy here in Indianapolis. It's a local sci-fi, Star Trek kind of centric um, uh, convention. And uh, we were fortunate enough to be able to be a part of it and then have a panel and have a booth um, and all that. It was, it was a really fun weekend. Um, so this is a recording of our panel uh, which was all about the summer movie season next year. It was moderated by uh, Mike George, one of the organizers from it, uh, who was just so, so great and so helpful uh, getting everything set up and everything. I, I, I can't imagine how stressful it must have been for him. So thank you, Mike, for setting all this up and giving us the opportunity to be a part of the convention and have the panel and everything. Um, also, thank you to Matt Quiet from Nerds Domain, who is the one who put our, put our name in the hat um, and, and told Mike about us uh, after meeting us at PopCon. So that was very nice. We got to share a booth with the Nerds Domain podcast, which is a podcast you guys should really check out. Um, and we'll have Matt on soon for, for a guest spot on the podcast, uh, relatively soon. Um, so yeah, and I just wanted to give you a heads up that some of the audio is not quite up to snuff. Because uh, we actually recorded recorded the podcast with the handheld recorder in the room, so we didn't have our normal setup. And also, there was some uh, there were some technical difficulties with the PowerPoint, so he could so so we couldn't play the trailers in the episode. So I'm cutting them into the episode here. So some of the some of the transitions might be a little jarring, but uh, I'm very proud of the content and pr- very proud of the uh, panel that we did. So once again, thank you to Mike uh, Mike George and to Matt Quiet. Uh, and yeah, I uh, hope you guys enjoy. Thank you. Uh, good morning. My name is Mike George. I'm the co-chair program for Starbase City. I'd like to welcome you to our 2015 Summer Movie Preview. Uh, The 2015 Summer Movie season begins May 1st with the release of the highly anticipated sequel to The Avengers, Age of Ultron. The uh, first film grossed more than $1.5 billion worldwide, and Ultron is the consensus pick to dominate the summer box office. But other big-budget blockbusters slated for summer release could offer some stiff competition. Uh, I'd like to welcome our panelists, Matt Hurt, Anthony Ramian? Ramian. Ramian. And Mike White from the Obsessive Viewer Podcast. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the Obsessive Viewer Podcast and how you guys got together? Um, and if you had to summarize the show, what would you say to people? Sure. Um, well, it started with, I started a blog in February of 2013, the Obsessive Viewer blog. It's at obsessiveviewer.com. I just started blogging about mostly what Netflix was doing with original programming and things. Then a few months later, we, uh, me and Tiny got together and, and decided to start a podcast, and uh, then eventually Mike came on, and we've been doing it ever since. And the podcast is a weekly topic-driven uh, movie and TV podcast. Basically, each week we take a set topic, uh, be it genre, trope, movie, or show, and we just discuss it for about an hour. And then if we have time, we do a, kind of a general potpourri section of anything that we're into and stuff. Um, it's a lot of fun. We, we really enjoy it. And uh, we're thank you very much for having us here at Starbase Indy. So I want to talk a little bit about Age of Ultron. Um, and we, basically where we're at in the Marvel Universe right now is is S.H.I.E.L.D. as we, we know it, as we knew it in, in Captain America, um, the Winter Soldier. Uh, basically, it's been torn apart by Hydra. And Tony Stark has been dealing with some pretty strong PTSD in Iron Man 3. Um, in Ultron, we're going to see Stark jumpstart a dormant peacekeeping program, a self-aware, self-teaching artificial intelligence. However, his plans backfire when Ultron decides that humans are the problem. And I brought this trailer for us to watch. It's the end. The end of the path I started us on. Nothing lasts forever.
So, guys, um, are you expecting Ultron to be as successful as Avengers, more successful or less? Like, yeah, I'll take that one. Uh, that's that's actually an interesting question because people might think that it isn't, right? Of course, it's mm-hmm. going to be huge. It's going to be the biggest movie of all time. The teaser <laughs> on the internet for a week, of course. Um, but I, I do think it's a legitimate question. I'll tell you why. Uh, all of us movie reviewers, that is, we're kind of bracing for this superhero movie bubble to pop. Uh, we think that there is going to be a fatigue eventually, and it's really only a matter of time when that happens, not if, but when. Um, so th- that could be, Ultron could be the start of that. That, this, that could happen. Uh, also, Ultron is a character the average fan isn't as familiar with. Um, in the first Avengers, we already met Loki, so there was an established threat. Um, also on that, there's no Loki this time, and, mm-hmm. and people love him. Mm-hmm. Another drawback, of course, is the inclusion of Quicksilver and Scarlet Witch. Uh, fans might have a problem with the fact that they won't be mutants, because, uh, you know, the, this, the character money disputes mm-hmm. with Sony. Um, uh, sorry, Fox, 20th Century Fox. Uh, and that we've already seen Quicksilver in Days of Future Past. So, so people might be a little worried about that. Uh, finally, it's a sequel, and as Randy said in Scream, by definition alone, sequels are inferior. <laughs> if it's not good, it won't have legs, and that's what's important for matching or topping the Avengers. Avengers made a lot of money in its first weekend, but exploded later on when people saw it second, third, fourth time, uh, like me. However, of course it'll be huge. Of course it's going to be huge. And I'll give you the three reasons why it's, why it's going to be huge. Um, first of all, number one, Captain America... The Winter Soldier and Guardians of the Galaxy. Uh, those two movies, they pushed the movie genre forward to that next step. Um, Cap was the better movie, in my opinion, but Guardians was huge. Biggest mm-hmm. movie of the year, of course. Uh, and in terms of what those movies did, they were game changers, much like the first Spider-Man, a lot like the Dark Knight, like the first Avengers. Um, all of those movies pushed the genre to, to heights of quality we'd never seen before. And fans, of course, are going to be looking to see if Marvel will do that again um, if they if they have that they have that up their sleeve. We know that the Amazing Spider-Man films are not doing that. Uh, we know that Zack Snyder's Dark Knight Superman did not do that, push the envelope. Uh, so we have to ask: Is Marvel our best hope? Which raises an interesting question: Two critically acclaimed comic book movies uh, released this year: Snowpiercer and Edge of Tomorrow. Um, the former was a hit on VOD. Edge was a bit of a disappointment, despite all the critical acclaim. Lived I repeat. Lived I repeat. Yeah. <laughs> after the after the title change, uh, but nonetheless, they they took little known comics, graphic novels, uh, and made really great movies. So I think that's that's what Ultron is going to have to compete with. Which brings me to number two: uh, why it will be successful. Ultron doesn't have the same competition Avengers did in 2012. Uh, of course, it bested The Dark Knight Returns and Amazing Spider-Man, but this year it's got almost nothing like those two established franchises to compete with. Of course, we're here for some of the movie previews. We're going to talk about a lot of the things it will compete with, but not none of them are on the, the caliber uh, or, or hold the weight that Amazing Spider-Man and uh, Dark Knight Returns had. Um, rises. Dark Knight Rises, yeah. Uh, so I have no doubt that it'll be the biggest movie of the year. Um, number three, simply uh, Robert Downey Jr. People absolutely love Tony Stark, mm-hmm. and this is our only chance to see him for a few years. Uh, Iron mm-hmm. Man 4 is, is back and forth, and 3 was a year or two ago. Um, so this is our Iron Man fix, and people will come strictly for that. Finally, uh, these, these damn teasers are so strategic. <laughs> <laughs> uh, people will come just to see the universe continue to expand. Who is Star-Lord's dad? Will we see Tony Stark and Steve Rogers start to disagree? Because we know that Civil War is coming in, right. in Cap 3. Um, so lots of questions, answers to which we probably won't get, but it's fun to wonder. Uh, and I, for one, can't wait. So yeah, it will, it will absolutely match the first one. I'm pretty sure it will exceed the first one. So I kind of feel like this, and I, and I kind of maybe the internet agrees with me that, that Tom Hilston uh, brought Loki to the screen in, in, the, in, our, in our two uh, Thor films and in, in, in the first Avengers. It was kind of kind of the breakout star of the Marvel Cinematic Universe right now. It's kind of a rock star. Mm-hmm. You know, oh, is Loki going to be back? Oh, we're making another Thor. Film. Is Loki going to be back in the next one? Is Loki going to be back? What? Now, now with this film, we're going to see James Spader take over as the villain. And uh, what what do you think he uh, 
can bring um, to the movie and to the Marvel Universe? Uh, what kind of effect will he have uh, as in, in voicing Ultron on the, uh, the, the series? And what will um, effect will Ultron have on the Avengers? Tiny, do you want to take this one? Yeah, I'll take this one. Um, I, I've been saying for years that I think James Spader is one of the most underrated actors in Hollywood. Um, you can say his name and people are like, who's, who's James Spader? But then you're like, oh, it's the guy from Boston Legal or uh, Better Than Zero. And, and you know, it's they, they realize, oh, yeah, that guy's really good. I just didn't know his name. Um, so I'm really excited about it for that reason. I think he's incredible. Um, but I'm particularly excited about it because this is what I love about established franchises is that they know no matter what they put out, this movie's going to be massive and it's mm -hmm. going to make a ton of money. So they don't need to necessarily bring in some massive star to play a sequel villain, you know. Um, they can bring in someone who's incredibly talented and who's sort of like a, almost like a sleeper actor that can mm -hmm. come in and just give an incredible performance. Um, and that's what I'm expecting from James Spader. Um, and I, you know, Having said that, I think this is a sequel villain. You know what I mean? It's not... If you look at some of the past sequels for these big franchises like this, usually the second the second movie, the villains are just kind of one-off. I mean, even the Joker in The Dark Knight. Mm -hmm. He's just in the one movie. Well, obviously, he's just in the one movie. But <laughs> I, I think even if Heath Ledger had not passed away, I, I don't think he really would have even been in the third movie. Um, See, I disagree with that. I think, oh, really? I think he would have been in the third one, for sure. Oh. Yeah. Has no I, ever, like, said anything? I... I you know, I don't remember, but I feel like I remember Bale saying at one okay. time that the There's Joker was playing. Nice. Yeah. Oh, really? Um, but I see what you're saying. I, I, yeah. I don't think yeah. you're wrong at all. It, aside from The Dark Knight, we've seen that several times before. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, that's typically the formula is they bring in this villain for the hero to kill, basically. It's, <laughs> it's, and there's it's usually just a bunch of character development, and there's uh, a villain just, just kind of there for them to kill, sort of a throwaway villain. Um, I'm sort of worried that's what that's what Ultron will be um, I don't really know the history of the character but uh, that's just kind of how it feels to me um, that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be a bad character though or it's going to be a bad movie um, I'm just really excited for it as soon as they announced James Spader I was just really excited so see and if I if I could just uh, jump into that for a second I, I think it's going to be interesting because and I don't know anything about the comics um, but I know with Civil War coming up and, and judging from the teaser, uh, seeing the Hulkbuster suit and stuff, I feel like there's going to be some kind of dissension within the within the Avengers, and that that, that could lead into maybe not maybe not lead directly into uh, civil war or anything like that, but kind of plant the seed that okay maybe they're not as they're not the like rock stars of superheroes. There 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 is infighting with them, mm -hmm. and that that could eventually lead to uh, to plant the seed for civil war and things like that. So then, are they going to break up, and then we'll have to wait till Avengers three for Tony St or uh, Steve Rogers to say Avengers assemble? <laughs> They're re <laughs> reassemble. Yeah, reassemble. <laughs> yeah, yeah, probably. I don't know. Well, it's interesting because looking at the slate after after um, I may be getting this wrong, but after Civil War, there's um, I think it's a either after the first. It was after the first uh, Infinity War. Um, part they're, they're going into the like uh, Inhumans, Inhumans and Captain Marvel. We'll get Guardians to Captain yeah. Marvel. Black so it's, there, yeah. it'll be interesting to see how they how they because because the, like Guardians of the Galaxy wasn't tied in with the rest of the universe or like like the, tangentially and all that. But it'll be interesting to see how they kind of connect everything because like Infinity War is going to be a big cosmic kind of thing. Uh, so it'll be interesting how it all ties together. Okay. Okay, so on May 15th, Warner Brothers is releasing a reimagined version of the cult classic Mad Max uh, with Fury Road. Uh, we brought a short trailer for the film, but it probably won't work, so uh, <laughs> thanks, Hydra. So, uh, My name is Max. My world is fire and blood. Name. Well, I, 
look at this film, I think I, I, it's going to kind of be a mixed bag for me. You know, Mel Gibson was originally attached to play the character again, oh, wow. but the project went through more than like 25 years of developmental hell. Jeez. So we, we have the, the same director from the first three Mad Max films, so you're going to, it's, it's going to be that universe uh, revisited. Uh, but, uh, but there has been a, you know, obviously a substantial uh, hiatus between the films. First film in '79, but you know they're quintessentially, to me, '80s film. Um, do you see this film as a reboot, or uh, do you think it will be closely tied to the other three films in the franchise? Uh, I'll take that one too. Actually, um, you know, I really don't know. I wish I, I wish I had a better answer, but it's they're keeping it kind of vague so far. Um, there is the you know the subtitle Fury Road, which kind of says yeah it's just another entry in the franchise, as opposed to a reboot. But looking at the trailer, it seems very origin like, like an origin story kind of thing for the character of Mad Max. Um, I, I think I think a modern audience is, is ready for this, uh, you know. I, so that's why I think it's it's sort of a reboot. Um, I don't think I don't think a modern audience really connects with the the eighties franchise of Mad Max. Uh, I think it's a little dated. I don't think it's a bad movie. I think it, I think you know people can watch it and enjoy it now. But I think again, just audiences have changed so much for this this genre that I think they need they need to update it like this. So, um, and I think obviously now we live in such a trailer culture. You know, we Mike mentioned it. You know, these these teasers are just so they're so ubiquitous now. Um, and so I think when people really start watching this trailer, when it starts getting put on TV, when it gets put before movies, I think people are going to get really interested because that's when I got really interested. Is when I saw the trailer a few months ago, mm-hmm. it really blew me away. I mean, it was it looks like a really grand action movie, like a simple plot, but like man, it just the, the the detail of it and it's such a it's such a chaotic environment and that really came across in the trailer I was really impressed with it um, it, it, it did its job perfectly it made me want to see the movie really bad and I think uh, that that whole side of my movie fandom of where sometimes I just want to watch some stuff blow up <laughs> I just like action movies it's totally tapped into that and I think there's other there's a huge audience for that mm-hmm. that has even more of a sentiment for it than I do so I think that audience is really going to show up for this movie and I think it's I think it's going to be successful. That's that's just just my pick. You said they're they're keeping a lot of it under wraps. That will not be the first time you hear that yeah. <laughs> during this panel. <laughs> that's kind of a right. Do you guys feel like Tom Hardy can fill Mel Gibson's shoes? How, how does he feel about Jewish people? <laughs> <laughs> I kind of hate Mel Gibson. Yeah, yeah I, I think so. Tom well, Hardy's a very talented. Tom Hardy's player. awesome. Yeah, yeah. yeah and if, if you look at um, the original franchise, Mel Gibson was. A nobody. I mean, no, nobody knew who he was in the, the Mad Max movies. Um, so it kind of established him as an actor. Um, Tom Hardy's already been established. I mean, the guy played Bane a couple of years ago. Um, he's been in some amazing movies. Um, I, I have all the confidence in him in the world for this. I think he's going to have. He's, he hasn't really been much of a lead yet. Um, he was in the movie Lock, which I haven't seen yet, but that was a small budget, independent movie. I, I assume he's great in it. That's what I've heard. I've heard it's um, pretty good. Yeah. So I, I, I think he absolutely has the ability to lead, um, to be a leading actor, and I, I have all the confidence in him in the world for this. Okay. So in June, audience can will be able to return to the world of Jurassic Park for, with Jurassic World, uh, the first film in the series since 2001. Um, Chris Pratt is attached to the project, and it's his first big role after the breakout hit him last summer, Guardians of the Galaxy. Uh, but there's no Sam Neill, no Laura Dern, no Jeff Goldblum. Uh, there's only one character from the franchise that re- that's returning, and it's a character from the first film that had a very tiny part. B.B. Wong um, played a, a character that showed up in one of the scenes where uh, John Hammond is explaining the how the... Uh, Dinosaurs reproduce yeah. on the island, and uh, the, that character is more established in the book, okay. um, but it was cut short in the film. So I, it's kind of an odd choice that they're bringing this character on the fringe back, which, but it was kind of interesting to me. Yeah. I think it ties it in a nice way. Um, what have you guys read about the film, um, and uh, were you guys big fans of the franchise? And uh, we're basically returning to an idea of the original 
um, with a dinosaur theme park. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, this, this time it seems like they're genetically engineering new, more docile dinosaurs. Um, are, are you guys expecting this to backfire? I, mean, I guess that's yeah. going to be flawed, you know? But yeah. Matthew, fan I, uh, franchise. Yeah, I, I am, uh, I'm a huge fan of the first movie. It's, that's, one of the, that's one of the movies that I, I remember seeing. A, one of my earliest theater-going experiences is, is seeing that movie, and I, I was just in love with it. And uh, the other ones, you know, a little lesser. But uh, that first one was just iconic to me. And it's, it's funny, when you, when you said that they're engineering uh, more docile dinosaurs, like that's... That's the one time where, like, I've been I've been hearing a lot of people say, like, oh, well, they're upset because they're genetically modifying new dinosaurs or genetically making new dinosaurs. But I never really considered that they would make them, like, docile creatures and, and stuff like that. And, I, like, I haven't read the, the books, the, the, the original book, but um, that's that's really interesting. I think that if they if they use that in the in the plot of the movie, that would assuage a lot of the uh, the the. Um, opinions of people that uh, were turned away by that, that line in the trailer. Um, but I, I think that seeing this, uh, I was floored by the teaser, or by the trailer, and it's because it's the fully realized vision of John Hammond's uh, vision of, of the, in the original movie, and I think that that is just, seeing the scope and the scale of it, I think it's just, it's it's mind-blowing to me, and it's 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 going to be really interesting, and I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. And Chris Pratt is amazing. Uh, and he and even though in the in the in the trailer some of the uh, the lines are a little. I'm glad you said that. Yeah, yeah. Because he started. Chris Pratt is amazing. Yeah, yeah. And other <laughs> stuff. Yeah, depends. <laughs> depends. Depends what kind of dinosaurs they, they yeah. picked up in that lab. Yeah, right, right, right. <laughs> just right. like exactly. some of the dialogue is just like. But yeah. I mean, he. I, I'm sure that he he can sell it. He'll, he'll be able to sell it pretty well with his with his personality type and all that. Um, but I think that it's it's going to be an interesting experience because this is it, it'll it'll be unique to the franchise at least, and it's been so it's been long enough since the last one that it's that it is an interesting it it's not I don't think it's going to be a reboot, but it'll be an interesting take on where the franchise uh, left off, I guess. Have you guys seen the the, uh, the Ian Malcolm remix mm -hmm. of his laugh? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's a there's a YouTube clip that's uh <laughs> that's like a ten hour version of that. Yeah. <laughs> uh. Okay. Uh, so what I kind of feel like the big family film of the summer is always the big Pixar release, and this Pixar. summer we've got a film called Inside Out, uh, which is slated to be released on June nineteenth. The story revolves on uh, around a group of characters based on different emotions in the mind of a little girl. Uh, there's a pretty strong lineup of comedians who lent their voices to the film. How do you think this film will rank in the uh, pantheon of Pixar? And um, I guess we could ask the question, what's your favorite Pixar movie? Whew. Well, I'll take this one. Yeah, it, well, it's funny that you say the pantheon, right, which suggests gods. And <laughs> if any of us worships at the temple of Pixar. I I love Pixar, but I'm not afraid to admit that they have some uh, some... Of late, they have some 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 titles that aren't that that uh, great, especially with the announcement uh, that they're going going to do Toy Story four. I feel like that's maybe a little bit of pressure on Disney side of things to to sequelize some of their properties, um, and that's why I'm really excited for Inside Out because this seems like it's a return to form. Uh, I hope a return to form for for Pixar because they're doing an original property. Um, it's a unique idea. Uh, the emotions of a little girl personified is is really interesting. Um, and, and the cast is incredible, but I, I'm just really excited because like this year we didn't have in, in 2014 we didn't have a Pixar movie, and uh, this this next next year we're getting two. It's Inside Out and The Good Dinosaur, both both original properties, both original concepts, and it'll be really interesting to see if it kind of wins back some of the acclaim because uh, of. I mean, they did Monsters University, which I thought was a very is a very good movie, but it's also kind of just not not really up to where the, where Pixar was, and uh, before that was Brave, and Brave was also an original uh, an original property. But I feel like, and there's there's a there's a thing online uh, a theory that that Disney 
Disney Animation Studios and Pixar kind of swapped in that year because uh, Pixar created Brave, which is a princess story um, and, and a family thing, and then and then Disney Animation Studios had Wreck It Ralph, which is like a very unique pop culture oriented um, uh, entertainment kind of like like uh, inanimate things come to life kind of kind of property that that uh, uh, Pixar has been known for in the past. So it's kind of interesting that that year they both kind of swapped. And in my personal opinion, Wreck It Ralph was vastly superior. <laughs> Because it was, it just spoke to me, spoke to me on so many levels, and uh, and now I just I just feel like Inside Out is, is Pixar's chance to kind of reclaim their their throne now that there are just vast amounts of uh, non Pixar uh, animation studios out there making really premium uh, quality things. They're not just going up against DreamWorks anymore. It's it's a whole a whole slew of uh, companies. Okay. And your favorite Pixar movie? Oh, yeah. my favorite Pixar movie. Ooh. <laughs> um, I would go with either Toy Story 3 or uh, Wally. Uh, Toy Story 3 because I cry every time. And I know that I just said that they, they, they sequelize a lot of things. But this was just a perfect cap on, on one of the best and original properties that, they, that they've ever made. And uh, Wally because Robot Love Story um, is just, it's so unique in its storytelling for me. Uh, what's your guys' favorite? Tiny. Um, I'd probably say Cars. No, it's not. I, really, uh, I don't like Cars. Uh, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a fan of Cars. Me and Matt have gone back and forth on that a few times. We have. I um, kicked him off the podcast. <laughs> uh, Incredibles is just such a good movie. Nice. I love that one a lot. And also, just to speak on Pixar real quick, they're feeling more like a corporation. Yeah. Since Disney bought, because Disney's one of the biggest companies in the world. Mm -hmm. They're feeling like a corporation as opposed to a studio now, yeah. which is all the sequelization over the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. But it's it's unfortunate, but hopefully they can, like Matt said, win back some of their acclaim. Yeah, yeah. I hope so. Mike, what about you? Toy Story three. Nice. It was made for me. I mean, it was yeah. made for us. Oh we, yeah. We were kids, mm -hmm. just like Andy was in the first one. <clears throat> we were a little older than Andy, I guess, in the third one. But yeah, yeah Toy but, Story three. Yeah, the Easily. incinerator scene. My God. <laughs> have you seen the Have you seen the YouTube of the the kids, the boys who show their mom, like they videotape her and they make a copy of Toy Story three where it ends at that point <laughs> and the lights come on and that's as awesome. she's flipping out like that's where it ends. I <laughs> haven't seen that. Yeah. I, I did. I did see. Which scene? I'm trying to picture. In Toy Story three, there's the incinerator, right? Kind, yeah. kind of the 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 climax, <clears throat> the action climax of the movie. Right. Uh, and. <laughs> So they're going into the incinerator. They're kind of saying their goodbyes. And in this YouTube video, it's this this mom and her her grown children watching this movie. And they made a copy of it where it ends right at that scene. Oh man! <laughs> yeah. Uh, ow. yeah, that's what it's basically her response. Uh, very dark. Yeah. Very dark. Yeah. Uh, so I'd like to talk a little bit about Terminator Genesis. Mm -hmm. um, this is going to be released in, in July, or the 1st of July, uh, next summer, and Arnold Schwarzenegger is returning to the franchise. Um, uh, I've been pretty happy with the film, even um, even the last film. I, I enjoyed it. Um, uh, but I guess the big question a lot of people are asking is, is how are they going to explain a way the age difference that, you know, because it's been, you know, uh, 2001, 2002, 2003, I can't remember what year Terminator 3 came out for. I want to say it was like 2003? Yeah, 2003 sounds right. But it's been, you know, 10 years since then, yeah. so it's definitely aged significantly. Mm -hmm. And uh, how do you... <laughs> it was a politician since then. <laughs> <laughs> uh, how do you think that they will explain that in yeah, I think that's problematic. Um, and I'm with you. I'm, I'm kind of a Terminator Salva Salvation apologist. I, yeah. I really like that movie. Rise of Machines, I think, I think is a weak one. But yeah. Um, but yeah, I like it too. And, I, and I've got all kinds of concerns for that movie, which is a bummer because I really, I really love the franchise. I really support the franchise. Um, to answer your question, I read a, an interview with uh, Arnold who said that because the machine is made with real flesh that is supposed to be, that is synthetic, but it's supposed to mimic that of human flesh, that of course it would age. But that seemed like a bogus answer to me. It seemed like he was, he was reaching, because I still wonder, is this the same, um, 
is this the same T-800 from Rise of the Machines? Or is it a new, is it a new machine? I, I, I don't know. I, I think it's problematic. Um, the movie is interesting to me. And when I, when I referenced earlier, you said they're keeping a lot of things under wraps. They're keeping even more, I think, under wraps here with, um, with Terminator. Uh, because they're retreading a lot of what happened in Salvation. Uh, and, and that's, and that's strange to me. Um, but I, I don't, I can't answer your question because I don't think anybody else can answer your question. Hopefully the movie, um, will. That, that, that explanation of it, it being synthetic was supposed to matter because that seems like such just, just kind of a, just a throwaway Absolutely. Kind of explanation. Right. I feel like that might be a little disappointing for, for fans of Frank. Yeah, definitely. And I can, and I guess I can buy it. I, mm-hmm. I can I can get on board because he had you know there was blood and everything and, and sure um, you know a leather couch agents right <laughs> synthetic material agents that's fine <laughs> but uh, this can't be the same machine and why mm-hmm. right I don't know I think they need to get away from Arnold in the in the franchise which they did in the fourth movie yeah so that's that's a, a bit of inconsistency there you know they, they I think that was a good choice I mean we had like a CGR CGI yeah, Arnold right. mm-hmm. Uh, in the fourth movie, but that's you know that's not Arnold Schwarzenegger actually making an appearance. But I loved that. Oh, because I did he too. even had the the 1980 haircut. Oh yeah, right. Yeah. I loved it too. That was that was a great choice. But you know they're they're trying too hard to keep him in the franchise. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't think he's going to be the draw that they want him to be for the franchise. It's just not. No, he know. hasn't done anything of note since he got back into acting. Yeah. Right. So I'm I'm not excited for that part of it, but I'm glad that they're making another. Terminator movie, yeah, and yeah, years. and Jai Courtney. I'm not excited about him as Kyle Reese. Mm-hmm. Um, the director Alan Taylor did Thor: The Dark World, which I also was not really a fan of. Yeah, I, he he's also a very prolific uh, HBO director, isn't he? Yeah, he's a lot, 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 of, lot of TV yeah, work. Uh, I think he did an episode of Lost. Maybe maybe, maybe a couple episodes yeah. of Lost. Um, so yeah, he he does mostly TV work, but his. His lone movie credit, I was not a fan of. Um, I I do really like um, Jason Clark, who we know from oh, yeah. Night of the Apes. He, oh, he's, he's awesome, fantastic. and he's John Connor. Very talented. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. I saw him in Zero Dark Thirty. Yeah. Kind of like, uh, yeah, that guy's gonna be a star. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Definitely. definitely. He's really great. He's another Australian. Jai Courtney is also Australian. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. Sam Worthington in the last movie was Australian. <laughs> Is <laughs> like, he? Wait, oh. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Christian Bale is from Wales. Yeah. That's right, that's true. Very similar. Hmm. So, my last big pick for the summer is the July 17th uh, release of Ant Man. Um, this film was one of the first Marvel Studio projects announced at San Diego Comic Con. Back at the same time, John Favreau announced his plans to bring the first Iron Man movie to theater. Mm-hmm. In the film, Paul Rudd is, plays a thief that tries to help a scientist protect his invention, technology that can make you smaller and exponentially stronger from an unscrupulous former colleague. At the time that the film was first announced, Edgar Wright was attached to the project. Most people know him from quirky films like Shaun of the Dead, Hot Fuzz, and World's End, uh, mm-hmm. movies where people with mundane lives suddenly encounter the wildly unexpected. Uh, Wright left the project earlier this year over creative differences with the studio. Um, how do you see this affecting the finished product, and how do you think the film would have been different if Wright had uh, stayed on? And largely, do you think that that might tank the film and be like the first signs of you know chinks in the armor of the Marvel machine? Might. Yeah, I can, oh, I can say. Well, you're just more familiar with it, Greg. I think oh, it's huge. Yeah. I think it's a huge loss. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think I've seen interviews with the stars who are who are trying to kind of put a bandaid on it and, and pretend that it's not as big a problem yeah. uh, as it is. I I see that you you mentioned a chink in a chink in the armor, but again, I would I would argue that the Thor movies are also not as successful and could yeah. could be kind of the first chinks. Um, I'm not. I'm not. Uh, I don't have my hopes up for Ant Man. Right. I really like Paul Rudd a lot, and mm-hmm. and hopefully he'll be able to uh, he'll be able to keep it alive. But uh, 
I, I think the loss of Edgar Wright is a, that's yeah. a pretty big one. In, in hearing hearing rumors about like the reason why he left is that is that Marvel kind of uh, the higher ups kind of, uh, this is unsubstantiated I think but uh, I've heard rumors that it's because they they rewrote the script that he and uh, Joe Cornish had worked on for a long time and he was just what not satisfied with it and I remember there was I mean there was just such a huge huge um, um, thing just after after it was announced that he was leaving the project because I mean he's been working on it for almost a decade and uh, I remember uh, Joss Whedon even uh, uh, posted a, a picture on Twitter of him holding holding uh, Cornetto uh, as a sign of solidarity to, to Edgar Wright and I mean I think Edgar Wright is such a talented filmmaker and he's he's such an off the beaten path kind of filmmaker mm-hmm. and I mean Scott Pilgrim it, as much of a not of success as it, as it was. Uh, as it should have been, um, it's a very unique experience, and it's very much uh, just like movies like that just aren't really getting made. And I think that with with Edgar Wright attached to a Marvel movie, that that was a really good uh, shot of Marvel uh, not falling into the same patterns because they have so many movies on their on their slate, and they have, they've been really good about making unique projects. And kind of. Most of them are in the similar kind of like just formula. yeah. Uh, well, picking interesting and, uh, and the right directors to do movies. Yeah. I mean, Joss Whedon for the Avengers was, <laughs> was so perfect, so spot on. Oh, yeah. uh, and even more, I'll, I'll reference Captain America: Winter Soldier again. The Russo brothers. Yeah, was just so weird, but oh, so yeah. perfect. James Gunn. Uh, yeah. For yeah. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Rare, rarely do you hear about a movie being ruined because of a director. It's usually mm-hmm. because of the studio. The studio. Exactly. There's so many studio notes. And exactly. When you just allow a visionary director like James Gunn mm-hmm. to just run with Guardians mm-hmm. or J.J. Abrams to run with Star Wars like mm-hmm. he's going to do, uh, I think Edgar Wright running with Ant Man would have been great. Absolutely. I think it's what that movie probably needed because mm-hmm. it's it's an, it's another sort of obscure. Mm-hmm. Uh, property from Marvel, um, and so in order to reach a broader audience, Edgar Wright would have been perfect for that. Absolutely. Um, there's, I think, they're still going to get their comic fan audience to come out for it. I think sure. it's still going to make some money and be maybe a moderate success, but mm-hmm. I think it, it could have been huge with Edgar Wright. So it's, yeah. it's an unfortunate loss. Yeah, and it, it's kind of it makes me a little nervous. As confident as their as their big Phase Three announcement of their of their Phase Three slate was, it still makes me a little a little nervous that they. They apparently are so. I mean, I don't know the inner workings of what made Edgar Wright leave, but I know that it it's a, it, it feels like a sign that they're not quite that confident as they are in, in the in the new in the press releases and stuff like that. Um, so that makes me a little nervous. And Ant Man is a a pretty big risk on their part because it's it's kind of a lesser known lesser known character, a very unique character. But I don't know. I just feel like it's not really the. It just feels like it's such a strange um, thing for them to do in, in light of all their confidence and, and bravado and grandeur. It's a weird thing. I remember the first time I heard about Ant-Man was before Avengers, was before before all that stuff. Mm-hmm. Of course, in the comics, Hank Pym as Ant-Man, Hank Pym actually created Ultron. Right. And so it was funny to see that that's where they decided to go with the sequel for Ultron, but knowing that it's not Hank Pym who's going to create Ultron now that we know it's Tony, Tony Stark so mm-hmm. it's another one of those bothersome if you're a comic book fan seeing what movie studios do to your beloved comic book characters sure. <laughs> so I'd like to take a minute and go over our what we think are is going to be the biggest hit of the summer um, I'm personally going with Age of Ultron I think it's highly anticipated I think it's going to be a, have a huge opening weekend um, I, I don't know how strong it's going to be compared to the first Avengers because people wanted to see uh, we're so excited to see that you know they're getting a little bit more of the same with this and and you know I'm I'm it might be I was a little worried with what James Bader was going to do with with uh, with the Ultron character and then I've seen the trailer and I kind of feel better about it. I think he's going to have lines and do things uh, just from just from listening to the trailer there's there's the you know he's using that that song from Pinocchio mm-hmm. yeah. in the background, and I'm like thinking to myself that song's a worm. Mm-hmm. You can't get that out of your head. <laughs> yeah. That's genius. Mm-hmm. And that's or the version with uh, my heart will go on. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> that, yeah. Yeah. Um. And, uh, 
So if you guys want to go over your picks for what yeah, you feel like today. First. Yeah. I, go right I wish I had a more interesting answer for you, because <laughs> clearly it's Age of Ultron. Right. I think the better question, the more interesting question is, and I know I know that we're here for, for the summer, but mm -hmm. is it going to be the biggest of the year? And I, I am willing to say yes, because... Really? Star Wars comes out in December, and we'll only have a few weeks. That's right. In the end, Star Wars <laughs> obviously will make more money. Right. No doubt in my mind. Right. But of the year, I, I think I think Age of Ultron, not just of the summer, but mm. the biggest movie of the year. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Uh, Tiny, do you want to hear next? Uh, yeah, it's the same answer. I mean, <laughs> that's the problem. Is it's not that it's like a weak summer. It's just there's such a clear front runner. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's like an NBA player showing up to a little league game, you know, it's a little league <laughs> basketball game. It's just not it's gonna it's gonna take the summer. It's probably gonna take the year with the exception of Star Wars maybe. So mm -hmm. uh, that that's that's just a clear pick. Mm -hmm. Well I think Magic Mike double XL is gonna <laughs> take it. No, um obviously I think Age of Ultron is, is gonna be the the clear winner of, of the summer. And I think that it's it's as as much as people might be um Kind of maybe that there's a possibility that we're starting to get superhero fatigue, Marvel fatigue, especially with them uh, announcing the next like decade of movies uh, or the next six years worth of movies and ten movies in, in the next six years. But we're coming off of in, in the franchise of the, the Marvel Cinematic Universe, we're coming off of two very very strong movies, uh, uh, Winter Soldier and Guardians of the Galaxy, both huge successes, and it's it's going to go into. Uh, you know, it's going to bring Age of Ultron kind of. I think people are still riding high from those from those movies, and I think that that's going to be a be a big big uh, success. Now, it's kind of easy to, for that for that to for, to say that for that, but it's interesting to think of future summers um, because because after this we're going to have uh, DC if they get off the ground, uh, they're going to have bigger. Uh, they're going to be more closely competing. Uh, in, the, in the years to come, they're going to try to, yeah. Um, so yeah, but I think Age of Ultron is, is going to sweep, um, definitely. All right. Well, um, I want to talk a little bit about the biggest bomb of the summer, you know, the <laughs> film that's going to get to not going to meet expectations. Um, of this list, um, I am the least excited for the new Mad Max film. Mm -hmm. Just and I think that's because it's just been 25 years plus of development hell on bringing another one of those films to the screen, mm -hmm. and Tom Hardy didn't you know became kind of a punchline with the Bane character and the voice and all <laughs> that, and he's going to be a great actor, but he I just don't see that this film drawing people to the box office, especially I mean it's been a generational a generation of. Mm -hmm. Be you know human beings since that the last film was on the screen, and you know what, young people today that have expendable income, I just don't feel like there's going to be a reason for them to go out and, and see this. Mm -hmm. um, they need to when they have a full trailer, bring. Um, they need to do things in the film action wise that you've never seen before, yeah. um, and have scenes that you absolutely remember, and those need to be in the trailer so that you can. So that people who have never seen this franchise before will, will be able to see the film. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, um, I, th I think that in terms of disappointment, I think um, are the biggest bombs. You know, I, I mentioned before a bunch of people have expressed some concern about Jurassic World, but I don't think it's going to be a bomb or anything. But I think that if subsequent trailers don't sway some opinions that that people have about the genetic stuff and the, the dialogue, like we kind of made fun of earlier. <laughs> Um, I can see that being a disappointment, but I think that I think I agree. Mad Max will probably be the most disappointing one. Um, although I would I would say that uh, Entourage is supposed to come out, and I don't think people are really going to go for Entourage. Um, but yeah, uh, yeah. And, and, and what I feel uh, about Jurassic World is, is with the separation between films, uh, people are still nostalgic. For Oh, yeah. For that, and what you really needed was was you know Sam Neill and Laura Dern mm -hmm. and Jeff Goldblum back together in the film, and yeah. even if it's even if it's introducing new characters and passing the torch, but you needed that torch to be passed and not be yeah. like B D Wong and you know the right. five minutes yeah. of the you know first Jurassic yeah. Park movie, and it's a strange choice for me. But turns out life does not find a way. 
<laughs> for those characters. Yes. Yeah. Uh, what do you guys think of your biggest disappointments? Man, that's tough. Um, I don't know. I, I predict. I predict. If you kind of take out those the obvious outliers, if you take out mm-hmm. Avengers, um, I think Jurassic World is going to be huge. Yeah. Uh, I think I think it's going to be a low. I think it's going to be a weak summer. Mm-hmm. I think I could pick a number of these that that will be. Um, but if I had to pick one, uh, Salvation was kind of a bomb, and I, and I think uh, Genesis will follow suit. Okay. Unfortunately, Terminator. Yeah, okay. yeah, I'm. I'm it's hard to say because we haven't seen a trailer for Genesis yet, like we have some of these other movies. Um, and I mean, yeah, I, I hate to go with Mad Max because I think it'll actually be, I think it'll be a financial success, but barely. Because mm-hmm. again, I think I think that trailer is just going to take off like wildfire. That's just my inkling. I think it's going to be like the the Dracula movie this year, which was kind of a surprise. It wasn't you know a big summer movie, mm-hmm. but it was a surprise and it made made a bunch of money. And they were really surprised at that. I think I think you could do something like that. Um, you know, so much of it's about timing too. It depends on when it comes out. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know. I, I really can't decide between those two um, until we see a trailer for uh, uh, Genesis. Um, but I, I don't know. I think there might be a movie or two that's that's not on our, our list that we talked about. Maybe we can talk about it later. That 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 will be more of a bomb. Sure. Um, so yeah. So I'd also like to talk about maybe like an unexpected sleeper pick for the summer of a film that you're kind of excited about. Um, that you think will do better than expected or anticipated. Something that, you know, um, I hadn't heard, I wasn't, like, I was aware of Christopher Nolan before Inception. I was aware of what, that he'd done the, back, the you know, the Dark Knight and the Batman Begins. And, but I had a friend talk me into going to see Inception and, and it blew my mind. And I want, I, I'm thinking of a film next summer that should be um, like that for me and it is a movie coming out uh, called Pixels that Adam Sandler is making and it's kind of a love letter to classic video gaming sure. and uh, I want to see it because Peter Dinklage from Game of Thrones mm-hmm. is in it and that man is hilarious and uh, he's fantastic so yeah. what uh, what movies are you guys expecting to be a big surprise this summer well uh, yes I, mean, I think uh, my pick is actually a movie Pan um which is uh, it's a live action version of Peter Pan, um, and I, I recently watched the trailer and it looks pretty cool. I think there's going to be a lot of, you know, seven, eight, nine year old boys who are going to see it and think it's like a dark version of Peter Pan, and they're going to be really excited for it, and they're going to talk their dads into taking them. Um, and I think there's going to be people that are that grew up with the animated Disney version, and then there's going to be a whole another generation that grew up with Hook in the '90s mm-hmm. that are going to have some nostalgic feelings towards this story and they're going to come out and see it so that's it has a little bit of star power too Hugh Jackman's in it um, Rudy Mara's in it so there's a little bit of star power there I, I think it'll be a, a surprise hit yeah nice Mike uh, you know before you said Pixels I would have said Pixels too uh, not because I'm excited for it over the summer we did our summer of Sandler yeah. uh, and we labored through talking about Adam Sandler all summer long so yeah. uh you know, we're kind of over Sandler. But I guess to pick a different one, I would probably go with Goosebumps. Interesting. Um, yeah, it, it kind of comes in at the end of summer, kind of gets into that creepy fall time of year, which I think is the perfect time for that to come out. Uh, it's also a family movie. It's also uh, Jack Black, again, doing a family movie. Mm-hmm. Um, pe- people will come to see that. We will. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, of course. We love Jack Black. Of course. It's School of Rock, pretty much. School yeah, of Rock, right. Fu Panda. Exactly. It's like, all right, you can do family stuff. Exactly. <laughs> and, and I think that's, I think that's going to be the mentality of a lot of people. Yeah. This summer. Nice. Um, I have kind of well, I, one pick isn't necessarily uh, for the sleeper hit because it's going to be a success. But I want to kind of backtrack and go back to the question about biggest hit. But I, I think that uh, we shouldn't short sheet. Um, the, the impending huge success of Furious 7. Uh, yeah. Because, yeah, so uh, well. I mean... Oh, I don't want to talk about this. <laughs> 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 I'm, not, I'm not a fan, but I do appreciate that the, that the last movie kind of kind of orchestrated, like, like went back and, and really um, uh, created this retcon of, of, of storylines that... Uh, for a franchise that I don't really pay You're attention to... defending Fast and Furious? I'm, right I'm saying that the end of Fast and Furious 6... 
was a very interesting way to go back because it takes place because um, it shows that the uh, the Tokyo Drift takes place after the or during yeah. concurrent uh, through some of these, and so it's 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 an interesting way for them to to maybe bring in some interesting stuff. And plus, it, I mean, it's a little. I mean, it's it's sad, but with with the passing of Paul Walker, people are going to run to to see what they do with the character. Yeah. Um, and so I'll, I'll see <laughs> See, I'm I'm kind of thinking the opposite of it. I think that really? I think their retconning is going to backfire. Really? Because I don't think people, I don't think their core audience for that franchise really cares <laughs> about the story. Yeah, I, don't know. <laughs> I think I think Fast Five demonstrated that because there's no, there's not really much of a franchise thread throughout that movie, mm-hmm. the fifth movie. It's it's pretty standalone, and it's just. Mm-hmm. I think I think the fans of that franchise want to show up and watch cars fly through the air and sure. watch some Dodge Chargers pull a, pull a, a safe through the streets of Rio de Janeiro. Um, but the trailer does show some really interesting action set pieces in it. Yeah. Um, so yeah, but but my actual pick for the sleeper hit will, will actually be uh, Paper Towns. Uh, it's based on a John Green novel. It shows that he has a huge fan base based on a uh, uh, he proved it last year with the the Fault in Our Stars was a huge success. Uh, the only obstacle in its path, though, is that it's going up against Inside Out, the first Pixar movie in uh, uh, over a year. So, but I, I think that I think that there, I think that there's a lot of goodwill in, in John Green's favor um, from from the Fault in Our Stars because I I it's one of my like favorite movie uh, book adaptations because um, it, it followed it so well. Um, so I think Paper Towns will be um, will be a, a sleeper hit. And I know you kind of touched on this before. I want to end this discussion with this. What do you feel overall um, about this slate of summer movies? Uh, I think I personally think that it's the the summer is going to be the summer is going to be a big success. I think there's going to be some uh, some some big the the bigger movies. I think that there's less of a risk of them failing. Um, and more of a risk of their their independent fan bases attaching themselves to it and being being a successful summer for them. Um, yeah, that, that's my that's my take on the summer, and I, I think that in future summers, like like I said earlier, I think future summers are going to be more interesting uh, to to discuss in terms of uh, uh, competition and, and oversaturation of certain genres. Uh, what do you guys think, guys? I hate to interrupt, oh, but I need to set up for the next panel. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. All right. We're all almost done. done. Yeah. Um, yeah. I've, it's same as you. Mm-hmm. I would say um, I wish there was I wish there was better competition, but for me, summer is just going to be a countdown to Star Wars. So. Sure. Yeah, pretty yeah. much. And yeah, it's, I think it's going to be a little weak too. Yeah. There's okay. not there's not going to be as many good movies as last year. So. Sure. Well, thank you guys for coming to our presentation of the 2015 summer. Movie. Thank you. Thanks for having us. And uh, you can we'll probably post this as a podcast on obsessiveviewer.com and uh, obpodcast.com. So thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Technical difficulties. <laughs> thanks, Hydra. Who does that sound? No! <laughs> oh, oh, no strings on me. Those are my real cheesy sound effects. We pretty it's pretty good, convincing. Yeah. Man, how much have you had to drink this morning? <laughs> Thank you for downloading or streaming the latest episode of the Obsessive Viewer Podcast. The music you heard at the top of the episode and right now is provided by Loud Like. Their EP, Mistakes We Must Make, features our theme song and Eclipse of Events. You can find that on iTunes, and while you're there, please rate and review them and us uh, and let us know what you think. Also, uh, like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash theobsessiveviewer. Follow us on Twitter at obsessiveviewer, at obsessivetiny, and at I am Mike White. And also check out ObsessiveViewer.com for reviews of movies, TV shows, and industry commentary. Uh, Also, check out ObsessiveBookNerd.com for book reviews and commentary on the evolving world of reading. And also Tiny's side project podcast, The Secular Perspective, is a podcast exploring the concepts of faith, religion, and existence from the perspective of secular hosts. You can find that on iTunes, Stitcher, and at TheSecularPerspective.com. Finally, you can email us at Matt, Tiny, or Mike at ObsessiveViewer.com or email the podcast directly at podcast at ObsessiveViewer.com. 
thanks again for listening, and we'll see you next week.